When a city is in shambles, when a city is not functioning optimally, the people that feel the effects of that are the people who have the least, and they suffer. It's not just inconvenience. They suffer. I could not tolerate that. I just could not tolerate it. It's time to change the world. There's got to be a better way. It's time for something better. You feel like you can't really make a difference, but the fact is that you can. We're telling the stories of people who are changing the world and how you can help. You know, we just need more companies that are out there solving these problems. Businesses, nonprofits, artists, and individuals who have found a problem and then created a solution. If we want to have real impact, we have to do it together. You'll come away from every episode with action steps you can take to be part of that solution. We're never going to feel satisfied and happy if we just stay the same. We can each change the world every single day. People can actually come together and build a future for themselves along with other people. Our daily actions have a massive impact. So what will we do about it? We can remake the world. Because guess what? We can. Hi, everyone. I'm Nathan Gardner. And welcome to We Can Remake the World, a podcast about people who are changing the world and how you can help. I want to share a quote I recently saw with you today. On my first visit to Berlin recently, I went to the Berlin Wall, to a section where artists have painted murals all over the remnants of the wall. A lot of it's been broken down, but there's this gallery called the East Side Gallery, where painters have been painting for decades since the wall fell in the late 80s. A few of these paintings are famous, and many of them are really beautiful and inspiring, but there was one that really stuck out to me, and I want to read the quote that's on this painting to you now. The quote is, Many small people who in many small places do many small things can alter the face of the world. The painting includes just the text of this in German and in English, and it's credited as an African proverb. But that's the whole painting, just that text, with some colors and some nature around, but mostly just the text, and it really struck me. I want to say something to you. You can change the world. You have the creative power to solve something for yourself or for someone else. You have ideas or actions in you that can make a difference. You're not insignificant, and your ideas are not silly or unrealistic. Your contribution matters. Even on your bad days, you have things to offer to others that can help make the world a better place. Don't ever forget, and don't ever doubt that. It's easy and even understandable to look around the world at all of our challenges and feel helpless or insignificant, especially with everything we're up against at the moment with shutdowns and lockdowns and the economic and psychological fallout, the health scares. When it seems like there's so much to fix, it's easy to feel like there's not much we can contribute as individuals. But I want to remind you that it's not about fixing every problem or any one of us fixing an entire problem on our own. It's about what we have at our fingertips to make the difference we can make now, today. It's not always about the bigger picture. Sometimes it's something small, which really matters too. It's not necessarily about the size of the impact we make. It's about making the impact we can. I'm so excited to share the story of today's guest for this reason. She inspires me so much as an example of a concerned citizen with a fire that she found inside to be part of the solution to a problem she saw. She saw this problem playing out in front of her and decided to take the action she felt she could. She looked at the knowledge and resources that she had and committed to making the impact that made sense for her. And I really think that if each one of us simply does that, this world could transform so fast. Glad you're here with us today. Kim Buffington reached a point in her life where she knew that there was something more for her, something more she could be doing, a greater legacy out there waiting for her to build. She knew she wanted to serve others in some way, so she asked a simple question of herself, what do I have in my hands? The answer for Kim was food. 
and an understanding around how to grow and distribute it and a passion for sharing it. And Eden Gives was born. Eden Gives is a nonprofit in Detroit, a city well known for its recent past as a difficult and sometimes dangerous place to live in. I should know, I grew up just outside. But things are turning around in Detroit, and leaders like Kim are paving the way for a community based renewal of this city. And this city is ready for some upward motion after years of hitting bottom when it comes to safety, public services, corporate investment and development, and opportunities for locals. Detroit is ripe for a new chapter. Kim and the Eden Gives team are feeding the food insecure in Detroit through community partnerships, and we'll hear from Kim about the program she has created to change the lives of hundreds of families who don't have consistent access to fresh food. In 2017, the Detroit Food Policy Council reported that 48%, almost half, of households in Detroit are food insecure, meaning these households do not have regular access to fresh food. The number of grocery stores in Detroit is minuscule compared to most major cities, and Kim will help us understand why that is. Kim also shares her vision for the future of Eden Gives, and her vision for the future of Detroit and food in Detroit, which includes urban farming programs, community education, and a renewal that is generated by the people who live in these communities. Kim is such an inspiring example of a citizen who made a pivot in their life. She was into her adulthood and she wanted to focus her energy on something more fulfilling, and she wanted to have an impact. So she focused on the knowledge and the resources that she had and the talents that she wanted to bring out of herself. And then she built something exactly where she was based on what she knew. It's something we all have the power to do, each in our own way. I hope you'll see yourself in Kim as someone who had just had enough of watching problems play out around her, knowing she could be part of the solution. Kim chose to become that solution herself where she was with what she saw. And so can we. So thanks so much for being with me today, Kim. Hey, you're welcome. Happy to do this with you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So I'd love to start with the start of Eden Gives. What inspired you to create it? So this, this happened 13, 14 years ago now, and at the time I was in the pastorate in the suburbs of Detroit, and I was taking teams on multiple trips to South America, to Peru, where we were doing a lot of really cool, innovative type of work, but one of the things we were doing was doing food distributions with pastors. And we had, on one particular trip, done three of those, yeah, where we we did the this type was where we the ladies at the church cooked a meal, and people came and got to eat lunch in the we did it in a park, a city park. I was standing there on this beautiful sunny day with all these mainly kids running around that had just eaten this lunch and just had a really strong like aha life changing moment where I had the realization that you know we had come six thousand miles to do these events, but there were hungry kids 30 minutes from my house in the suburbs of Detroit, and I had done nothing for them. And so I came back, and right around that time, the Trader Joe's stores were being built in the, in the Detroit area, and the one that was closest to our church contacted me. Trader Joe's donates food every day of the year from every store. They are a zero-waste grocery store, and they were doing it bef way before anybody else did, because wow. this was 13 years ago. Do you know if any other grocery stores have the same policy? Um, I, Whole Foods does to some degree. Um, they don't do the same type of program that Trader Joe's does. They pay their employees to pull the food that they're going to donate, which is the thing that grocers have trouble doing. They don't want to waste the food, but they have to look at their business model. Well, Trader Joe's has made their business model work. Um, I don't know how they've done it, but they do it. So the employees pull the meat uh, at night before the store closes, and they put it in the walk-in freezer so it freezes overnight. So if it's expiring that day, it gets pulled that day, but it gets frozen. So from a food safety standpoint, they can still donate it. Because if I bought that the day that it was supposed yeah. to expire and took it home and put it in my freezer, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, right. 
And then the next morning when they come in, they pull all of the produce, box all that food up in banana boxes. It's about 20 to anywhere from 20 to 38 bo banana boxes of food every day from one store. They needed me to pick up on Sunday from that store because they had another food partner picking up the other six days. So we said yes to that. And we started distributing that food in the city of Detroit. And then we ended up over the next five years starting to pick up on Sundays from the West Bloomfield store and the Ann Arbor store and push that food out not only to Detroit but into Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor, if you're familiar with Michigan. At year nine, the Northfield store called me and asked me if I would start picking up every day. And that's where it really got so very interesting because we're, now we're, you know, we're, we're looking at 200 families every week, and it's the same families every week, which is another thing that makes our program really unique. I've learned a lot about food security um, from our families. I've learned about how the system doesn't work for them. Our food system in America and how we um, supply food in communities doesn't work not only for the urban center of Detroit, but many of the urban centers in our country, in America face the same problems. What are some of the things that they've said? There's no markets. I've heard other people in other areas like L.A., like Chicago, like Philadelphia, like New York City say the same, they have the same issues. Before our food system changed, which it, there was a dramatic change in the 1940s and 50s to the grocery store that we all are very familiar with now. Before that, it was markets. Uh, before that, there weren't suburbs in the way there are now. And before that, people didn't drive to get their groceries. They walked to get their groceries. And so there were, in Detroit, there was a market, a corner market, about every six blocks. And people would walk to the market. Ironically, I do this now myself. I have switched to become one like them, and I love it so much better. I love I love going to Trader Joe's because I'm so stinking loyal because they're so good to us. I go to Trader Joe's, the closest one to my house, which is about seven miles away. And that's in Detroit, right? You live in Detroit. I live in Detroit, but I go to the Gross Point one. It's actually, okay. there's not a Trader Joe's in the city limits of Detroit. But I go about every two or three days, and I get enough food for two or three days. And that's the mo that was the model that was used before the food system shifted in the 40s. And that decision was largely made by, well, the person that affected it the most was the man who was the head of the agriculture department in the United States. And we started doing large crop growing all over the United States for things like lettuce. And uh, that's why we now have, uh, most of our lettuce production is in the Central Valley of California where we now have a drought yeah. because it takes nine gallons of water to create one head of lettuce. So we're draining all of our water sources because we're growing too much capacity on too small of, of a piece of land. We're tearing apart the structures that nature has in place for growing because we're doing that. It doesn't work. It's not workable. It's not workable on the community level either for, for the reasons that most of the people in the city still walk to their food. They, yeah. they use public transportation or they walk in the city of Detroit. Is that the biggest barrier then with that change that was made from markets to supermarkets, so to speak, is that it's access, it's ease of arriving at the market? Absolutely. And, and if you go back and now study the data, what you begin to see Medically, in Detroit, a large part of that went away in the 60s during the, after the riots because when the riots came, the, the markets were destroyed and the people that owned them were white people who were then afraid to live in the city, so they left. But the markets were not replaced. And what happened was the white people ran the markets in the people of color communities. People of color bought from them. They weren't the business owners. They bought from them. So when they left, it created this huge vacuum that's been there ever since. Health has been impacted tremendously in our city because of those markets have not been there. And so we see, if you go back and look at data, then you begin to see, especially in our African-American communities, we see higher rates of obesity, we see higher uh, diabetes, we see higher heart disease. And if you put it on a timeline, you can see where the, it begins to start happening in correlation with the markets disappearing, in correlation with um, Detroit becoming what was later known as a food desert, and when the system became extremely inequitable for people who could not move out of the community, who had to live here, and they had to eat what was available. 
So when they walked, they're walking to the gas station, the liquor store, the party store, and getting whatever they can get there, which is, or some of our fast food restaurants, unhealthier choices that were available, and it's had a huge, huge, huge impact on overall health now for over 60 years. It's amazing to think that that has been that way for that long because of one major event, you know, it was significant, but the fact that it's still having effects on the communities in this way. Would you speak a bit more about, you know, what is a food desert? What does it look like in other urban centers that you're aware of? It's, it's very similar. The, the food deserts all have a lot of things in common. What they have in common is a disrupted food system. And many of them, like Detroit, had a market system. I mean, you've been, you've been in New York City, as have I. We still see the corner markets in areas of New York, right? And so, and you know how much the community relies on those. So in urban centers, they, there may be some markets there, but the number of markets has been drastically reduced. And when that food component, when that market component in particular goes missing out of a community, the people that live there, and especially in an urban center where people tend to not have a car or drive, they tend to use public transportation, then they have to go farther, sometimes two, three, four communities over to, to get access to a market. And, and the farther away it is that you have to go, the less often you're able to go. And what made, it, made everything work was the fact that you could walk six blocks in one direction and find a market. That's what made it work before. So having to go farther than six blocks makes it difficult. And, and then people will, you know, they come home from work, they're tired, they don't want to then wait for a bus up to 20 to 30 minutes for a bus line to take them three miles up the road so they can shop at a market and wait another 30 minutes or 40 minutes to take a bus back. That all gets very complicated. It's not doable from a life standpoint. And I can't imagine for single parents, for example, or two-parent homes where the parents may have to have two jobs, it's just impossible. It just it won't work. It doesn't. I'll give you one example. When I first moved into the city of Detroit 10 years ago, I lived up on the Upper East Side. In that particular community, there were a lot of young moms with children. And on, on my street, within three houses either way and across the street, you know, the, that many houses, there were 25 children among the moms that rented those homes. And at that time in the city of Detroit, this is 10 years ago, the, ci the city was in shambles. There was no such thing as uh, plowing the streets. We plowed the streets with our cars by driving them. That's how we did that. The sidewalks didn't get done. There was a bus stop at the end of the block, which was about 14 houses from where me and these young women lived. So there was a bus stop there, but the closest Kroger was out of the city, so you had, to drive, you had to drive about two and a half miles to get to it from where we were at. Two and a half miles away, but on the bus, it was almost 30 minutes one way to get there because of the route the bus took and how many times it stopped. So you've got a mom in the snow <clears throat> with two children on a street that's not plowed with a sidewalk that's not plowed, somehow getting those kids through a foot or a foot and a half or two foot of snow to a bus stop where they all wait to get on a bus to take a 30-minute ride one way to go shopping at a Kroger store. It doesn't happen. It's not worth the trip. It's too difficult. But those were the things that weren't working. And at that time, too, in our city, the bus system was not working properly. And so the posted signs, it kind of used to be a joke. You know, they'd say, when's the bus come? The next bus coming? And the answer was, whenever it wants to, you know. <laughs> um, you could look at the schedule, but... There was no assurance that it would arrive on time or that it would be on a 20-minute cycle, which many of the buses are. So if you saw a bus pulling away, you, you didn't know that another one would come in 20 minutes. Every system in the city seemed to be broken in a way that made it more difficult for the people who had the deepest struggle to access food to get their hands on it. Do you think that this illustrates some of what makes 
Detroit sort of uniquely challenged by some of this, you know, because there wasn't as much corporate investment or development over the last few decades as there might have been in a city like Chicago, depending on which neighborhood you're in. Do you think that's why some of these problems have persisted for 60 years? I think that they were worse 10 years ago than they were 60 years ago. I think that because wow. of the city's bankruptcy, everything was in shambles and everything didn't work. And the, but, but the thing that just I witnessed firsthand that made me just say, this has got to stop, is that when a city is in shambles, when a city is not functioning optimally, the people that feel the effects of that are the people who have the least among us. And they suffer. It's not just inconvenience. They suffer. And, and that just, I could not tolerate that. I just could not tolerate it, which forced me in, to take some action on my own to begin thinking about, like, how do, we, how do we empower people so that they don't feel like they have absolutely no hope to get their hands on food? You know, there's got to be a better way. And it had me start looking at models around the globe, out of the United States. You know, I think everyone looks at the United States and say we have everything together. We don't have everything together. I'm telling you a story about something that's really big that we don't have together. Then I, I began to, to think about what's in my hand, what do I already have that I can bring to this conversation, and then are there people, are there communities globally where everyone eats? And if there are, what are they doing so that that can happen? Um, so I began to view the work that we were doing not as just, I knew that the food I had from, from Trader Joe's was a gift, I knew it was a resource, and I know it helped. But I wanted a stronger solution. And I wanted to empower people to not be afraid that they would be hungry. And so we had to think in different ways about how to do that. So how are you doing that with Eden Gives? It sounds like food delivery is part of it. We haven't spoken much yet about just functionally how you serve these families in addition to food delivery. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, there's definitely tears. You know, the first thing that came into my hand was food to give away. So we focused on that. Um, we now do 11 food distributions a week, uh, getting food from Trader Joe's. We feed slightly over 300 families, the same families every single week. And there's a lot of value in the way that we do our food distribution, which is very different. Most food distributions are communicated about through community centers, and people show up, they get a box, it's real generic, it has a lot of non-perishable foods in it, not a lot of produce in it. That's one of the first things that people that get our boxes that have been in other food distributions are like, wow, this is full of produce, and they're super excited. And we're like, we know. <laughs> and we're happy about that. <laughs> so, and that and those distributions generally happen sporadically, not weekly. Because we were getting weekly food, what we did was we got weekly families who would come weekly and get a weekly box of food to see what would happen. And what happens is this. There's some really strong, positive things that happen for a family when they can get a box of food that has one to two meat items in it, maybe a dozen eggs, depending on how many dozen we get, and then it's just full of produce, all kinds of produce. And so them getting that every single week, taking that home, eating out of that box, what we've done over time is we've done the distribution, pulled four boxes out, used a calculator, and added up the value of the box if you just went to the store and bought those things. It's about 60 to $65. It runs in that range. And so for this family, they're getting enough groceries as if they went to the store and bought 60 to $65 worth of food, which means they don't buy as much food for themselves. And over time, families have been able to save that money and purchase college, purchase training to get a better job, purchase a car. That's happened more than once. Saved money for two years. Bought a car that was reliable that got them transportation to an area of town where they would have to drive because it's so far away, but they got a $5 per hour raise wow. working in the new place. That type of stuff is life-changing. That's a hand up, not a hand out. The food is allowing them to reach up in their life to a better life, never mind the health effects. Right. I was going to say the health as well. I mean, just having access to fresh produce on a regular basis. Don't have to think about it. Don't have to invest in it. It's just there. 
We have a lot of health stories. Um, the most common one is for people that are in their you know, mid-40s and higher uh, c- coming, because we serve a lot of seniors too, which makes my heart happy. But um, being able to take the box and, you know, two months, two and a half months afterwards, they come and say, I went off my blood pressure medication and my doctor says it's because I'm eating this food. Wow. And we're like, yes, your doctor's accurate. You changed your diet, which is what they w- will say to them. But they, you know, if you don't have the money to do that, nor have the education, which we, we do a lot of nutrition education standing over a box of food in a parking lot as well. Sure. We teach, train how to, you know, there's certain things that come through, like we had, we get spaghetti squash through a lot. And so we have the, you can substitute this for your, for the pasta in your spaghetti. And this is a great trade up for you. This is going to, you know, help you lose weight. It's going to help you have more energy. So we teach them how to roast that spaghetti squash, how to take the fork and scrape it out so it actually looks like spaghetti. And next week they come back and they're just like, this, it was so good. And I felt better after I ate it. I didn't feel, like, tired. I felt, like, energized, you know? So a lot of that's happening, too, as we're doing this weekly distribution to the same people every week. But Raya is probably our strongest health story. Raya came. She's a vet. Uh, at that time, was working at the VA hospital. We, we ended up signing up about 50 families from the VA hospital, which we were really excited about. Um, Raya had some mental health issues due to PTSD, She's a vet, and her PTSD was from her time in service. She was on eight medications. Some medications you take for mental health can cause your blood pressure to elevate. Um, So she was on blood pressure medications due to that. She was overweight enough that it was limiting her capacity to even walk comfortably, like to take a walk. And so she went on, on, uh, she started picking up the box of food, and within eight weeks she was off blood pressure medication. Within three months, she had lost 20 pounds and could go on walks. And then she really started losing weight. She went from having eight medications, I think, down to two. The other thing she's done is she's maintained her job. This was another thing due to the PTSD. She had trouble maintaining employment. And she has maintained her present job for over a year. Um, So she's hit some really strong landmarks. And if she was sitting here today, she would say, it's because I got a box of food. Everything that happened happened because she was able to eat better and more consistently. When you see stories like that and when you see the impact, when kids get out of a car and run to you and wrap their arms around you and thank you profusely for the food they're getting and tell you what their favorite things are from their box, you know this is having impact. And that happens often. It happens every, every time I'm there anyway. That's, that's what's going on. It's such a special example of something that, you know, somebody on the outside may say, okay, what can I do to make a difference? Like delivering one box of food to one single person on a regular basis. It sounds super simple, but the effects just ripple outward and outward and outward. And you don't know how much it means to somebody until you start doing it and you get that feedback. And it's the kind of thing that our volunteers, it reshapes their view of the story that many Americans have around this type of activity and what it does or doesn't do. There's a line of thinking within our country that people who need food assistance are there because they're doing something wrong. They're not able to take care of themselves. In actuality, I have stood so many times in in parking lots talking over boxes and thought, oh my goodness, if your story was my story, I would hope that someone would help me too. It's more that than anything else. We spoke with somebody else who rescues leftovers from organizations in New York and donates them. And his family, they worked very hard, but they were limited with their access to food. And, you know, any of us could have gone to school with somebody who was in that position. And the face of food insecurity is not so easily defined. It's not. And I I will say this too, our program doesn't hit every level of food insecurity it hit we are really good at meeting this level of food insecurity there's another group of people that need this food just as bad if not more but they don't have the capacity to show up every week they don't have transportation they have a physical problem that they can't walk to come get it and they have no one to help them 
I, I have to say that because it's and it's important because we need other people to be in the game for them. Within a half a mile of where I live, where I'm sitting right now, there's probably 10 apartment buildings that are full of senior citizens. We don't hardly do anything with any of those buildings because, like I said, they're not able to come down. The ones that can do, but most of them can't. There's a great organization in New York City called God's Love We Deliver, and they cook meals and then hand deliver them specifically to folks who are too sick or too advanced in age to to get anywhere to take the food. It's I did some deliveries for them, and it's really a beautiful program. It and is. Just another example. It's like, and everybody's got a piece. No one organization's going to solve Correct. it all. Correct. But as a collective effort, it's like, I can do this part. I can focus here. So we call ourselves food warriors, and what we, we hold to this ideal that if we care for each other, and work together, everyone can eat. And it takes all of us, though, caring about each other (laughs) and working together and taking the resources that are in our hands or using an idea that we come up with. And as we all do that and do a part, then collectively we have greater impact. We cannot underestimate the power of food in people's lives. Those of us who are fortunate enough to take access to food for granted may not realize that there are millions of people whose quality of life is impacted by a lack of access to food every day. Either they don't have enough food or what they have lacks nutrition. Detroit may be an especially clear example of this because of the lack of supermarkets, as Kim described, but there are food deserts all over the country, areas where the residents don't live close enough to a supermarket to have regular access to fresh food, to more nutritious food that's not processed. The United States Department of Agriculture, or USDA, estimated that in 2016, there were 24 million Americans living in food deserts just in the United States alone. And many nonprofits and research groups believe that this number is actually much higher, that the USDA's criteria left a lot of people out who really should be in this category. But Kim has a solution for urban food deserts beyond just donating food. She wants to reinvent urban farming and urban communities with modern technology, and she wants to use this program to give communities in cities like Detroit access to fresh produce grown in their city, grown right around the corner from where they live. I asked him to share her vision for the future of Eden Gives and how she got started with this idea. I come from farmers, so both of my grandfathers were farmers in Kansas. They Oh, each of them owned about 100 acres of land. But, um, but then also my dad, um, who was also a farmer until we moved to the suburbs of Dallas where I grew up, we grew a lot of our produce. So that's where my background was, and I felt really comfortable growing. But I began to look at scale, and hydroponic growing made sense. I started thinking about this about seven years ago. I started researching that technology, and over the seven years, um, that technology has really grown Now we have very large-scale hydroponic farms growing lettuce, greens, and herbs. And I started one of those about uh, in August of 2018. I started a vertical, indoor vertical hydro farm, which is it's doing really, really well. And I I think a greenhouse hydro model works better and is more easily scaled and easier to use. So we're now launching one of those here on the Lower East Side. We're going to do a whole community development project that's way, way beyond the farm thing, too, that allows us to develop a section of town, especially since we're going to be putting the large-scale farm in there. We'll have 100 employees there. We're hiring from the community, so it makes sense to put some affordable housing in for them so they can live within walking distance of the farm. And there's, a, there's some blocks in a particular area of the community that are uh, open and uh, would be a good place for us to do all that. So... We're planning to do that as we launch this second farm. That is so exciting. I mean, I don't know of any model like that where it's a true urban farm, not just farm with quotes where it's fresh produce brought in or a community garden, which is still super valuable, but truly grown here in the city. 
Yeah, it's been it's been like a, amazing. The last two years, it took me like seven years to get the first farm funded, and then after that happened, and it was and uh, being a woman in a new new industry where things that made the front end of that go really slow, in my opinion. But um, but once now that we've got up one up and running, and the hydro industry has now taken what I think is another giant leap forward in scaling itself and having more farms being successful, even though the, the large-scale farms uh, most have not been, but there's, there's several now that have been, so it can be done. I think it makes investors a little bit more willing to take the risk and jump in. So the funding for this farm is um, coming together a lot faster than the first one. It That's makes great. me happy. Are there some examples that you would call out as far as what's been done around the country or around the world for this kind of thing? Anything that you're inspired by as you're kind of distilling this idea and starting to create it? As far as the model goes, one of the people that early on inspired me was Will Allen, and he's in, I think, Milwaukee. And the, Will was Will was doing a greenhouse type hydro growing in a time when nobody else really was yet. He was ahead of the technologies that are available now, but he was going at it from exactly the same viewpoint of saying, we have an opportunity with this technology to get jobs in communities where that's another reason why I want this to be here is like these jobs start out at $17 an hour. That's a game changer. Yeah. Where the minimum wage is, 10 bucks, 10, 12, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, so that, that, that right there is a total win. But Will was, Will was ahead of everybody in, in thinking about taking this farm and putting it right in an urban center in a neighborhood that needs the food, like people can walk to this farm and get the food, and was an early on success story and was thinking about the impact of the food in the community, not only to nourish it, but to provide jobs in it, and how he was thinking that way before many, many people, including myself, were thinking about systems when he put that farm in. And, and I really admire him for that. And then there some of the people that have been thinking about technology and how best to grow this produce in such a way that allows us to go to take it into urban centers, to take it into cities. Am Hydro is the company whose technology I'm using, and I'm so proud of their technology because they put their hydroponic technology inside of a greenhouse. So I can go on any lot I want, and I have a greenhouse that'll fit that lot. It, that's a game changer. Because, and, and they have a whole system. I just have to buy their kit. I can scale it all over the city. So the food distribution points that we have in the city, many of them are at churches in association with a pastor. And so I'm already talking to these pastors and saying, do you have land? Almost all of them do. Can we put greenhouses? Can we put farming greenhouses on your land? Yes. That can change not just this community. It can change every community we put that technology down in. We're giving somebody a business opportunity, whether it's that pastor. I don't want to run all these farms. I just want them to be in communities, and I want to help other entrepreneurs get started, but we want to do it strategically so that we're going into communities that have the strongest need for this produce to be there first and working with local people in that community, having a business owner in that community, and then from a community standpoint, people have access, and they have it in the way that they need it. Yeah, and it can really revitalize a whole sort of artery of, of an urban center. You know, there are jobs, there's access to food. And then, uh, like you were saying, other businesses come because they want to be close to the action. It's in a city like Detroit, where there's sort of, you know, a white canvas in some ways with, with some of the infrastructure and some of these lots, it's kind of the perfect place, I think, to start. So one of the sideline things that you're absolutely right, Nathan, but the one of the sunlight things that comes in when you're producing food and packaging it is the opportunity to have a processing center that is not just for you but can be used for other people who are in the food business. So and in Detroit we have a lot of food makers and the thing that we, we need more of is medium sized commercial kitchens for them to come in. So somebody has a jam company. They make jams and they need to make them in batches. So they need a medium-sized commercial kitchen. Well, the building I have for processing produce to get it out to sell to our customers is the same building that they can build their products in. 
And so now we have another business where we can offer that kitchen to food makers in our off hours. And when we're not using it, they can come in and use it. And then they're renting it, renting the space from us, but they have access to a very large kitchen. We're building the food economy, if you will, by, through partnership, by building a building that multiple people use to produce food products out of. Which is also so exciting. It's just using resources more intelligently. It's like necessity might breed it in a way, but it's just, it's better in the long term anyway. It allows everybody to benefit more because if people are less concerned about covering costs, then they can grow more quickly or at least more consistently and not fail as often. And if it's a shared resources model, then there's just so much potential in that, I think. Well, agreed. And I look at it like I want people to come use this kitchen because then I can get those products. They're right there. I can say, hey, we want those in our market right here. Can you, will you sell those in our market? And now we're locally sourcing our food. So our economy thrives in this environment. Why would we want to have another brand of jelly come in from the outside and we're benefiting somebody we don't know who has no stake in our game, um, it's much better to bring you know, Detroit Slow Jams in to, into our market and the folks in our community buy from the person who makes this product in our community. Yeah, I know. In a way, you're going back to pre-1940s. Agreed. You know, before that big shift happened, it's like we source from what's here and those who sell and those who buy are both invested in the same relationship and the ones who are profiting from it aren't you know, hundreds of miles away, they're right here. And the producer is more, I think, accountable because their customers know them. And it just, it's almost a throwback in a way. It totally is that. And, and part of my contention is that the system wasn't broken. Um, and we did a fix on a system that actually worked. And, um, and, and agreed, as we, you know, built suburban communities out, there had to be a way to go to market but our urban centers didn't need a fix. They needed to be able to continue doing what they were doing. Yeah. I think what the other thing that's so important for Detroit that this helps to accomplish too is it is bringing people together around food. And that builds community. Food always builds community. If I want to get to know somebody, I sit down and have a meal with them because people let down their guard when they're eating. And it's, eating is actually an intimate act. And what's been missing is with all of the terrible things that have happened and the way the communities have fallen apart and the violence that was here that now is going away, people just didn't talk to each other. They, didn't, they kept their drapes drawn all the time because they didn't want to see what was happening outside. And the feeling that many people have had is that they're all alone and on their own in the world. And that's a terrible feeling to have. I, I view you know, everything that can happen around food and the way we've discussed on this podcast actually brings people back together again and brings them multiple times in the context of, of coming together where they see each other in safe places and where they can um, actually have true, authentic community again. Hmm. Um, and that, that's a gift. That's a gift. It's a beautiful thing to watch and the benefits of it that I thought would be there are there. And, and it's been so exciting to watch it come alive and to watch so many people in the community come forward and say, what can I do? What, what do you want me to do? How can I help? You know, what, what's next? What is next in the short term? Sort of what's, in addition to some of the food distribution that's happening now, what's the absolute next step? So the, the next step is we're adding five more days of food distribution. One of our Trader Joe's stores is we're picking up only on the weekends now, and they're going to have us pick up all seven days. So that's going to happen in the next two months. We're excited about that. But just about a mile that way west, um, we are actively looking at land. We've identified uh, several blocks that we want to purchase We've already begun to talk to some of the folks who we would want to be in the retail space. Um, but the farm, we can get up and running pretty quickly, and we hope to have that up. I would love to see us digging in the ground in the summer. If we can get the greenhouses up before uh, the fall hits, then we'll be running before the end of the year. So, One thing I really love about this is that you started with 
food distribution. You started with what, as you've said, was in your hands. You knew you wanted to feed people. You knew there was a way. But now it's sparked so much more. And there's branches that can come off of this tree. And um, then I'll be so excited to follow how this grows and how this adds to the fabric of how Detroit is kind of reinventing itself and acknowledging that it's you know starting from a pretty rough clean slate but there's a lot that can be done because of that the cool thing is you know there's only one way to go up you know and and the other thing we have a, a our mayor now mayor Duggan Mike Duggan he's done so much for the city he has made so many things possible so much of the positive stuff that you're hearing about Detroit coming out of the city now is due to his leadership in the city. He, he has made ways. He has secured funding. He has um, been supportive. Some, some of the development stuff that's happening, not just with us, but just all around the city, they have given communities the opportunity to create what they want, which doesn't happen in, in development normally, especially urban or in, uh, in the suburbs. The mayor was just like, there's so much land and there's so much opportunity here. We just need to let people create what they want to create and rebuild the city. Let them rebuild the city with us. And so this mayor has focused on certain corridors that needed to be addressed first. And then in outer lying areas like where I live on the Lower East Side, there's been a lot of latitude. I mean, you bring a good idea to the plate and they'll help you secure funding and get you going. So I've got two more questions for you. One, how can people support Eden Gibbs. What are the ways that folks who live nearby in Detroit or in the suburbs around Detroit can support you? And then what are ways that anybody can support you? Easy ways. Uh, The first two, like if you go on our website, edengibbs.org, right across the top, there's a volunteer button and a donate button. And we need volunteers for food distributions, but we also like right now, like if I could have a social media team that was volunteer, it would be like the most beautiful blessing. These days with technology, you can be anywhere. You can support exactly. Eden Gibbs from anywhere in the world if you've got access to the internet. So reach out. And if we have a team, then everyone just contributes one thing and it's a couple of hours a week and that's it. You know, But it has a huge impact on us and a huge impact on, getting, uh, on us being able to connect with people in the city and get stories out, which are really important. So that's one thing that needs to happen. And you can just click on the volunteer button. It pops up a form fill out the form, I, it comes to me basically, and then we contact and, and set things up. And then, of course, the other way is just to give, you know, to donate and support. We've been an all-volunteer force for all these years, and we are now at the point where we cannot exist that way anymore. That, that would be a lovely gift um, you know, if some of the listeners would donate. Great. And my final question, I came across something on your website that I wanted to ask you about. It was a phrase in, I think, Hebrew... Uh, tikkun olam yes and i looked it up and i just would love to hear you speak about what that means to you and maybe what it means on paper but also why is that incorporated into your business or your nonprofit? yeah so when i incorporated the nonprofit, um i was unsure of what i was going to call it and tikkun olam is hebrew for repair the world and i had in my spiritual studies i had come across that phrase Um, working with the Jewish community here on a project. And I I loved the concept, and I loved the idea that our lives can do that, that we can repair the world by how we live, how we move, how we be, whether it's interactions with other people, maybe even largely through interactions with other people, and how we approach conversations, especially difficult conversations. But through our hands and through the work that we do every day, we get to choose whether we're repairing the world with that or not. I get so jazzed up when I hear people like Kim speak about their ideas, about potential, about vision. If you really picture what Kim's describing when she talks about her urban farm and this community center complex, it's pretty amazing. It's like this one element of a community is injecting so much life into it, bringing people together around a project that directly impacts their lives because it's around food. 
I think Kim is so right about why projects around providing food have so much potential. Food is life. Food is universal. And Kim's working on ideas that bring all of that potential to life for the local communities that she's working with, where she is, where she lives. That brings us to changemaker number one. We do these every episode, three ideas that could change the world based on our conversation with our guest. So changemaker number one for today, food is essential and there is unlimited potential at hand when we transform our relationship to food for the better. As we've said, food is universal. All of us need access to it. And when you inject a community that has limited access to food with new sources of it, so much can change. We talked about food deserts with Kim, areas where grocery stores and fresh food are limited or non-existent for communities. And I like that image of a desert. So think of a desert. When you add water, the landscape in a desert can transform and quickly. Life springs up immediately once that key resource, water, is provided. With food deserts, you add fresh food and communities transform. Lives change. You inject a different kind of life into that community. With a single weekly delivery of a box of fresh groceries worth roughly $65, the families that Kim is serving have been able to up-level when it comes to their professional lives, their education, and their health. Because food is essential, it's that essential resource, and because food deserts are often populated with disproportionately higher numbers of low-income residents, offering low-cost and more consistent access to healthy food is probably the most powerful first step in turning that community around. Access to food of any kind, and especially access to healthy food, should not be an exception in any area of a developed country like the United States. Food security is not meant to be a privileged experience. It's a right that we should all enjoy. I think Kim's vision for the future of Eden Gives and for urban farming in general is also so compelling because of all of the different outcomes that are suddenly possible when you think about things in a bigger picture way like Kim does. You start with growing fresh food and you do it in a way that keeps prices affordable for the locals. Locals work in the indoor farm. You create a space to sell that food and connect with the community regarding food, employing more people in that community. You then share that space with other local businesses who can affordably bring their products into that marketplace. So local products are, again, benefiting the community. And if you're building all of this in an urban or suburban area where religious organizations or other benefactors can offer land or buildings for free to build these farms, or local governments are willing to make purchasing land and resources very affordable, the potential just grows and grows. Suddenly, a community which was barren, which was like a desert when it comes to its most necessary resource, food, springs back to life like an oasis in the desert. The health of local people increases, improving their quality of life. More employment opportunities transform the local economy. Small businesses become more resilient by sharing the cost and leaning on each other for resources and spaces. Local markets return to selling mostly, if not exclusively, local products. And the sense of ownership within the local community changes everyone's relationship to their market, to their food, and to each other. It's a way to bring people together for mutual benefit, which is really exciting, I think, in a world where so much has become kind of decentralized and we all shop at these massive grocery stores, which are global even. Bringing things back at least partially to a locally based economy has a lot of benefits and you can have a mixture of the two, which leads us into change maker number two for today. There is power in supporting and fostering local community solutions to local community problems. A decentralized food economy like this one, where a lot of it is locally based, protects communities from some of what has happened in Detroit since the 1960s, where the markets suddenly disappeared and nothing stepped in to replace them, as we heard about from Kim. An urban farm that is deeply connected to its customers and to the locals will serve them in a way that large supermarkets simply can't. It's not sustainable often for large supermarkets to really get to know those in their community and kind of customize everything for them. And in areas where corporate investment is minimal due to maybe a perceived lack of profit opportunity, renewal becomes possible because it's not based on investment. It's based on community strength. 
Communities, which likely felt disempowered because of a lack of resources, can now work together to build something that ensures that fresh food is a right that they can all enjoy, benefiting their economy in the process. And changemaker number three, focus on making the change that you can. All of this, anything, starts with a commitment to a vision, like the vision Kim has been forming over the last 14 years. Kim began with weekly food collection and delivery, and over time has built her vision into something greater as she connects more deeply with her community and searches for and builds solutions that she believes can make a greater impact. It's taken time, patience, commitment, resilience, and she's overcome obstacles, but she's one person who has made the choice to be part of the solution where she is based on the problem that she feels passionate about. And she's taken it into her own hands to make the change that she feels is hers to make. And she's starting at home, where she's close to the problem, where she's close to the people she can serve. This is one of my favorite points that Kim makes early in our conversation. There's something we can all do, wherever we are, right in our local communities. Kim had gotten accustomed to the idea that she needed to travel to another country to support those in need. But Kim realized that there was something she could do exactly where she was. There's always something we can do exactly where we are. And Kim's story shows us becoming more deeply involved in the challenges faced by our own local communities creates opportunity for us to make even greater change because we see the outcomes, we see the tests, we see the trials, we learn as we build. We're right there next to it. The people Kim is serving aren't way over there in the other part of town or far away on another continent. They're her neighbors. They're the people she shops with and walks by on the street. And, as Kim says, if we care for each other and work together, we can solve any problem. Because it takes all of us, or at least more than a few of us, caring about each other and offering whatever gifts or tools we have to really make an impact that lasts. Here's what you can do today around food insecurity, as we've spoken about it with Kim. First, jump onto Google and do a quick search for food donation programs in your area. Especially if you're in a city or suburban area, there are very likely programs you can support with food donations or volunteering in your community. If there isn't one, consider starting one if you have the time and you feel inspired. Another way to build more of these programs is to contact your local grocery stores and markets. Chat with the manager next time you shop. Ask them if they have a food donation policy for any food that is about to expire, doesn't sell, and if they don't, Ask them why not, what would it take for them to build it, to start it? Start these conversations in your community around food donation so that it becomes the norm. Get others passionate about ensuring that not a single person is hungry in your area. Spend some time thinking about what resources you have right now at your fingertips that might benefit someone else, that might repair the world in some way, as Kim describes it. What talents do you have? What connections? What ideas do you have that you could put into action to serve an individual or a community in a positive way close to you? As we each consider what we have to offer and then make a commitment to ourselves to offering it, to bringing it into being, the world changes little by little. Many small people in many small places doing many small things, changing the face of the world. Just like our quote from the Berlin Wall. And that's our challenge for today. Make some time over the next two weeks to sit and reflect on what you have in your hands that could make a difference in someone else's life. Journal about it. Share it with friends or family. Make a plan to take one small step towards sharing whatever talent or resource or skill you have with someone else. You don't have to rush into it. You don't even have to have the answer in the next two weeks. But start the conversation with yourself. And once you've come up with your thing, your idea, take one action step toward making it a reality. My thing right now is this podcast, telling these stories, but I'll come up with a few more for myself too. There's always more each of us can do. If you'd like to support Eden Gives and you live in the Detroit area, visit edengives.org to sign up as a volunteer, E-D-E-N-G-I-V-E-S dot org. Their work is more crucial now than ever. If you are tech or social media savvy and you'd like to sign up for some virtual volunteering from wherever you are, Kim would love to hear from you. If you'd like to donate to support Kim's mission to feed more families in Detroit, you can also do that at EdenGives.org. 
We'd love to hear from you about the change that you're making, the ideas that you have, the inspiration that you're finding based on the conversations we're having. Give us a shout on social media. Our goal is to build a global community of people who are committed to contributing whatever they can, wherever they are, to building a better world. We want to know what you're up to, and we want to know what's inspiring you. Or who are you inspired by? Is there someone we should interview on the show? Someone we should feature? Send us an email, podcast at wecanremaketheworld.com with anyone that you're inspired by. We'd love to invite them to chat with us. Visit wecanremaketheworld.com for more information about all of our guests with links to resources and information. And if you enjoyed today's episode and want to keep hearing stories like it, hit subscribe, leave a review, give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you're listening from, and share these stories with others so that we can spread this message of possibility and empowerment and inspiration. We've spoken to some truly amazing people, too, so check out our past episodes. We're so proud to tell these stories. Tune in in two weeks for our next episode, and until then, stay calm, stay safe, support yourself and support others, and thanks for being here with us as always. Thank you.